I'm Mariah Blackhorse, and this is the Wildlife Resource Story for the Camp Lake Project Area on the Malheur National Forest. For the Greatest Good charges the Forest Service with sustainably managing our national forests to ensure that these lands remain healthy and productive now and forever while allowing the land to serve the broadest and greatest public interests. This is a tall order. In many places today, like the Malheur and other east side forests, the greatest good is restoring tired and worn forests to better health and resiliency. As a wildlife biologist, my role is to help conserve and reinvigorate land and space for the great variety of species that reside on the forest. Nature is at the heart of this place we call home. Before I walk you through some of the resource highlights for the Camp Lake project area, I will give you a brief overview of some of the policies which guide our habitat management activities for wildlife. I am not going to go through all of them, but as you can see, there are quite a few. The Endangered Species Act requires the Forest Service to ensure that any actions we take will not jeopardize the continued existence of any listed species or result in the destruction or adverse modification of designated critical habitat of such species. The majority of our forest birds do not live here all year, but return with seasonal regularity. Most return in summer to set up breeding territories and raise their young. Chipping sparrows, yellow-rumped warblers, western tanagers, Williamson sapsuckers, flammulated owls, to name a few. In addition to other benefits, they provide an important prey base for many of our other forest residents. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act, signed in 1918 and amended in 1936, 1974, and 1989, implements the United States commitment to four international conventions with Canada, Mexico, Japan, and Russia for the protection of migratory birds. In 2008, a memorandum of understanding was signed between the Forest Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to promote the conservation of migratory birds. In part, this memorandum states, migratory birds are important components of biological diversity. Their conservation and management will help sustain ecological integrity and will meet the growing public demand for conservation education and outdoor recreation, such as wildlife viewing and hunting opportunities. The Forest Service Manual provides numerous directives related to wildlife management. It directs the regional forester to identify sensitive species occurring within the region. Special management emphasis must be placed on sensitive species of native plants and animals to ensure their viability and to preclude trends towards endangerment that would result in the need for federal listing. Sensitive species may include birds, mammals, or invertebrates like this silver-bordered fritillary, a butterfly associated with bogs and open riparian areas where marsh and bog violets are found. The National Forest Management Act, enacted in 1976, requires the Secretary of Agriculture to implement a resource management plan, also known as a forest plan, for each national forest. This act is implemented via planning rules. The current Malheur National Forest Plan went into effect in 1990 and uses the 1982 planning rule. The rule directs the identification of management indicator species, which are selected because changes in their populations are believed to indicate the effects of management activities. The rule also requires that forests manage fish and wildlife habitats to maintain viable populations of existing native and desired non-native vertebrate species. The Malheur Land and Resource Management Plan also known as the Malheur Forest Plan, specifies forest-wide standards for wildlife and direction for specific management areas, such as big game winter range and old growth areas. It defines 13 terrestrial management indicator species and six 
featured species. In addition, the Forest Plan Amendment Number 2, commonly referred to as East Side Screens, provides additional direction for wildlife habitat management related to timber sale activities. Rocky Mountain Elk are likely the most popular big game species in Eastern Oregon and are responsible for many recreation visitor days. Elk are popular among wildlife watchers, outdoor photographers, and of course, hunters. In fact, due to the high level of public hunting interest, elk are designated as one of the management indicator species on the Malheur National Forest. As a management indicator species, elk serve to indicate the condition and function of the habitat that they share with numerous other wildlife species. Elk are an indicator of forage and cover abundance and quality, and the patch dynamics that comprise quality elk habitat. Additionally, elk serve as a meaningful indicator for those species that are sensitive to human activities. Several forest plan standards are specified for elk, primarily related to cover, forage, and protection of known calving areas. Among disturbances to elk habitat, roads have been implicated as a major factor influencing distributions of elk across the landscape. Forty-nine percent of the Camp Lick project area is designated as Big Game Winter Range. The remainder is Big Game Summer Range. Critical in this project area are the densities of open road networks which exceed both winter and summer range management area standards and consequently contribute to a lack of security habitat patches for elk. The Camp Lick project area is comprised of three subwatersheds: Lick Creek, Lower Camp Creek, and Upper Camp Creek. All three subwatersheds exceed the winter range standard for open road densities, and one of the three subwatersheds exceeds the summer range standard for open road density. The Camp Lick project area falls within the Northside Game Management Unit specified by Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Elk population numbers for this unit are above the management objective, but the distribution of elk within the unit varies significantly, not only by seasonal forage availability, but by changes in human activities on the landscape. There are numerous effects to elk populations resulting from road density and human access. The, removable, the removal of usable land from the habitat base, an increase in elk vulnerability, increased incidence of other types of disturbances, reduction in utilization of habitat next to roads, redistribution of elk populations from public onto private lands due to high disturbance. One of the methods for increasing elk security is the Green Dot Travel Access Program, an agreement between the Malheur National Forest and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. The Camp Creek Cooperative Travel Management Area has been in existence since the early 1970s. The majority of the Camp Lick project area falls inside of this green dot system. Currently, these closures are seasonal, comprising two periods during rifle hunting season in the autumn. This provides a temporary means of reducing open road densities. On the Malheur National Forest, Approximately 35 wildlife species are known to depend on or prefer mature conifer habitat during some part of their life cycle. The pileated woodpecker and the American martin are designated as management indicator species for this habitat type. Martin particularly is a species of high concern in the region. In the approximate 40,000 acre Camp Lick project area, over 3,000 acres are modeled as martin habitat and over 8,000 acres as pileated woodpecker habitat. By providing a dispersion of mature and old growth conifer habitat sites for the pileated woodpecker and American martin, it is assumed that the other species, which also prefer mature and old growth forest areas, will have adequate habitat to maintain viable populations. Minimizing habitat fragmentation and ensuring sufficient downed wood for cover and thermal protection in the winter may be key to optimizing habitat use 
by American Martin. The project area currently has 3,232 acres of designated old growth stands. Per plan standards, replacement old growth stands must be identified within a quarter mile and total at least 50% of the designated old growth acres. Based on the currently designated acreage, 1,616 acres needs to be identified and designated as replacement old growth. Additionally, pileated woodpecker feeding areas of 300 acres in size must accompany old growth areas which are specifically identified for this species. Four of the 11 currently designated old growth stands are identified for pileated woodpeckers. Creation of required feeding areas totals 1,200 acres. Areas of old forest structure exist in the project area which may be suitable to establish the old growth areas which are currently lacking. Dead and dying trees are an essential component of natural forest ecosystems, providing invaluable habitat and a means for nutrients to cycle back into the forest. In three of the four wildlife habitat types used to analyze snag numbers, the current occurrence of snags greater than 20 inches in diameter is less per acre than occurred historically. This table lists the current and historic percentages of acres in the analysis area with two or more large snags. The fourth habitat type is lodgepole pine. It is not represented here due to its low occurrence in the project area. While snags are important in all forest habitat types, ponderosa pine is perhaps most utilized by a wider array of species. Ponderosa pine trees generally produce excellent snags for wildlife, and some of our high-priority cavity nesting species, like the white-headed woodpecker, are closely associated with ponderosa pine snags. Historically, these forest areas experienced regular understory fires, which kept the stands open and fuel accumulations minimal. The oldest trees grew large and eventually provided large snags as isolated singles or in small patches. Today we are working to restore these ponderosa pine forests to their historic conditions, but many of the largest trees are gone, and the snags that now occur are often smaller in diameter and have a lesser value to wildlife. Dedicating old growth areas is one way we hope to protect large trees so that they may once again produce the large snags so valuable to wildlife. In the Blue Mountain forests of eastern Oregon and Washington, almost half the vertebrate species, 179 out of 378, make some use of logs. Logs create important microclimates on, under, and around them as moisture is collected and sheltered around the log perimeter. 30% of all nitrogen in soils is attributed to dead logs. Martin, in particular, need not just a single log like this one, but a pile of large woody structure in which to create denning sites and to provide thermal protection for their long slender bodies in the winter. Habitat fragmentation is a dynamic process that results in marked changes to the pattern of habitat in a landscape through time. Three types of change associated with the process of fragmentation sets in train a progression of species loss overall loss of habitat, reduction in size of fragments, increased isolation of fragments. These aerial photos show the same section of the Camp Lick project area in 1939 and 2012. The area inside the yellow ellipse encloses an area approximately one-third of a mile long by two-tenths of a mile wide. In 1939, the road along the riparian habitat conservation area had not yet been built, and the forest stand is thick and continuous to the riparian area. In the 2012 photo, you can see the road that was built along the riparian area, the thinning of the forest structure, and the loss of connectivity from the forest interior to the riparian corridor. There has been an overall loss of habitat a reduction in size of the remaining fragments, and isolation of fragments. 
movements of animals and plants, and the flow of wind, water, and materials between habitats is a key element in the functioning of natural ecosystems. For animal species and communities to thrive in landscapes heavily modified by people, connectivity within the landscape must be sufficient for individuals to move, to obtain the resources they need at different stages of life. In 1995, the Regional Foresters Plan Amendment Number 2 directed the identification of connectivity between blocks of habitat to protect against habitat isolation. Currently, there are no connectivity corridors defined in the project area. Connectivity networks need to be delineated between stands of old forest structure, both within the Camp Creek watershed and across into adjoining watersheds. While connectivity corridors do not necessarily meet the same description of suitable habitat for breeding, they are intended to facilitate free movement of adults and dispersal of the young.